A warm welcome to Lost for Words. I am your host Jason and this week I am joined by prospective Tory councillor for Newton Mearns North and Newston, Andy Morrison. Andy comes on the podcast this week to talk about his humble beginnings growing up in the shadow of Celtic Park, qualifying as an accountant and now being a director of his own firm, his political beliefs and we talk about the political landscape in Scotland ahead of this May's local elections. This is a good one. I will speak to you on the other side. A quick housekeeping note before we get started. Please leave a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts, whether that be Apple, Google, Spotify, Podbean or any other platform. It's the best way the podcast can grow and better content can be produced for you, the listener. It's your listening experience that matters the most. But enough from me, now on to today's episode of Lost for Words. You grew up in Barrowfield, so tell me a bit about the early part of your life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Barrowfield was one of those once notorious estates. You know, it was blacklisted, etc. It was um, even the subject of a BBC documentary in the 1980s called The Scheme. Not the remake, obviously, they made in Kilmarnock. It's an area that underwent a lot of change when I was growing up, so... The, the previous Labour, Lib Dem uh, government and the Scottish Parliament, when they were in, there was a big redevelopment of the, the housing stock in Barrafield. And there was a, a softening, you could say, of, of the area. And it's changed beyond recognition now. Um, when, when I was growing up in the area, though, um, I was conscious of... I wasn't overly political when I was young, I'll be absolutely honest. I didn't even do modern studies as my choices at secondary school. I was a geography person. I was like interested in how people lived and how cities were formed, like urban geography, but not quite so much in politics. That that came later on. Uh, what do you say when people say, oh, well, Barrowfield isn't a very conservative area? Well, it's certainly more conservative now than it was when, when I was growing up because it's part of uh, the Calton Ward, uh, which this is, uh, has a conservative councillor in it. Uh, and you're you're absolutely right. I mean, the politics I grew up under were completely different to what we see in Scotland now. It was more normal politics of left and right back then. And Glasgow was dominated by left-wing politics for about seven decades. And the area I grew up in, you know, you could see where a lot of that had fallen apart, where it had failed EastEnders high levels of crime, for example, low levels of aspiration. And, you know, if you if you wanted a change, was it another party of the left or was it time to try something different? And it was actually somebody else who identified me as a Tory when I was doing day release courses to train to be an accountant. One of the classes was economics. Now, economics spills over quite easily into the field of politics. And we were looking at the 1980s and Keynesianism versus monetarism and what Margaret Thatcher had done to the country. And I found myself on the opposite side of the debate from many people in the class. And it was a Danish guy there who said, you're a Tory, but that's fine, because so am I. And I'm like, what's a Tory? You know, I was so ignorant of politics at that point in time. I just spoke what I thought was right from what I had learned and what I'd studied. So um, that was that was the point, really, where I thought, hmm, I need to look into this a wee bit more. It's interesting. So you were identified as a Tory rather than identifying yourself. It's like that yeah. case of the chicken, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? You're probably the opposite way around to most in that circumstance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that was around 2005, 2006 kind of era. Um, I didn't do anything about it at that stage because you know I was working a full time job. I was studying towards a college course and then the professional accountancy qualifications. I, I didn't have time to add that to my life as well as you know be able to maintain a, a normal social life and some relaxation time as well. So it was really when I qualified as an accountant that I started to dip my toes into politics and that was roughly the same time as the Glasgow East by-election which you 
You may remember. Yes, the two thousand and eight. Me and my friends have got a picture with Alex Salmon because he came. We were outside playing football, and him and John Mason and the SNP sort of entourage were walking about. And I've got that picture somewhere of all of us with football and Alex Salmon standing with us. Not not so great a picture now, not something to be bragging about after what's happened with him. But. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, but I, I, I think the thing is, Jason, it kind of speaks to how totemic a figure Alex Salmon used to be and how much he's fallen since then. Massively, it's he, crazy. It's crazy it's how been, things change. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I mean, that that was a it was a very interesting campaign, and it was um it was an interesting time to be a conservative because David Cameron had just come in, and he was setting about changing the party, revamping its image, and you know a lot of the the, the policies that were being pursued at that point in time was for places like the East End of Glasgow, places that had been left behind despite all the excitement of the the new Labour government. And there was something about that that really appealed to me, you know, that the Centre for Social Justice, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and David Cameron, I think, set the tone for the Conservative Party throughout the 2010s and up to the present date and the, the whole levelling up agenda. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself a Conservative, but I would say that I think he, I think history will look back very kindly on David Cameron. I think he was incredibly competent. And the, I don't think it's a coincidence that the country has declined since he departed office. I wouldn't say that the country has declined, but I, I certainly think there's a bit of nostalgia for the way politics was during that era in 2010. I think it speaks to just how broadly the party had changed under David Cameron, because there was no way the Conservative Party of 2005 or 2001 with Ian Duncan Smith, William Hague, that, that, that was never going to happen. So I think that was uh, a testament to the fact that they changed the Conservative Party in 2010, the modernisation agenda. It wasn't just lip service, it was it was a real substantial overhaul. So then, if I had to say to you, like, simply, why are you a Conservative? What are your main values that you would point towards? Yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I think the first thing for, for me in, in growing up was... Um, there was quite a lot of negative influences around me. And, you know, there were peers I went to school with who were more intelligent than me, that were brighter than me. Sadly, you know, that their lives haven't quite, um, how should we put it, worked out in a stable manner. Materialised in the the way that they wanted it to. I I mean, outcomes like um, dependence on drugs, dependence on alcohol, some of them aren't here anymore through suicide or drug overdose or gangland activity. And, you know, the main argument of, of the left at that time was you, you, you rise with your class. And for, for me, it was more a case of, well, I want to go to school and learn every day. I want to apply myself to something. Why should I be held back by people that don't want to do that? I would say of a, of a different view now because I'm, I'm away from that, I've moved on from that, but when you're in that environment, you see it and I think you feel it more acutely. Um, so I would probably say that I'm not quite as right-wing as I used to be. I think I've mellowed with age and mellowed with, with distance from, from roots. And there's also a sense that, you know, among some people in, in the left, in my opinion, that you know, there's no such thing as bad behaviour, there's no such thing as good behaviour. Everything's kind of relative to each other. And I don't think that can be helpful in some settings. I think in some settings it's quite helpful to say this is a good desirable thing and this will be rewarded and this is a bad negative thing and, and this will be punished. What well, a book I read recently I was I found very interesting, and I hope I don't damage a guy's street cred by saying this, but Darren McGarvey's book, Poverty Safari, there's a lot in that that I can identify with. Like just how difficult it is being a working class boy in a scheme in Glasgow. How difficult it is to pick up a book, to concentrate on reading a book. When in a classroom, not wanting to appear to be interested in reading a book. So a lot of my learning in the classroom, I feel like, was covert. You know, you didn't want to be seen to be trying too hard. And I think that's absolutely bonkers. I really do. I don't know why we do it to ourselves. Because the means are there 
of people from any walk of life, any background, to really do what they possibly can, what they possibly want in life, if they take the opportunities. And Scotland has a huge track record for that. You know, Scotland's a country, it used to be a country, where anybody from any walk of life can invent the next big thing. Scotland shapes so much of the modern world, the, the television, telephone, penicillin, etc, etc. And I think we've moved away from that somewhat. But the important thing was that anybody from any walk of life, if they engaged with education positively, they could shape society for the better in that way. Uh, so I think for me, the development of my politics was a bit of a, a rebellion against what was around about me and what I seen. Because I felt like the system that is just now, the Labour Party owned that. The SNP is another party of, of the left by and large. They've continued it. So if you really want to see a change in society for the better, there's only one other option in town, and that was the Scottish Conservative Party, and that's kind of what brought me in the door. As you sort of went through your accountancy, as you did your studies and you qualified and you started work, how did you play a more active role in the party? Um, well, at that stage, I wasn't in the, the party, to be honest. Um, I had a, a developing interest in, in politics. You know, from my time at school, I had no interest in it at all. Um, I would just have assumed that I was a Labour voter and probably voted Labour and that was it. Um, but definitely have still been a unionist, though. Um, going through accounts of work, etc. It, it wasn't a big thing on, on my radar. It was something I had to develop an interest in for. It was when I got through those exams, which I really had work in the Glasgow spy election, um, I was approached by the Conservative Home website to write a, a blog about Glasgow East because, let's just say, they didn't have a big readership there at the time. Um, and they then got an invite to the, the Tory campaign launch, which was in St Jude's in Bayliston. St Jude's being the patron saint of Lost Causes, as you may know. Um, yeah which uh, wasn't lost in anyone. Um, David Cameron was there himself, uh, along with Ian Duncan Smith and our candidate at the time, Davina Rankin. And I met these other people and I thought, oh, right, okay, there's there's other Tories in Glasgow. This is this is great. There's some people there from like the University Association. Because up to that point, I thought, maybe I'm literally the only you know, member of the party in, in, in the city. Um, but you know, then I saw others, and that was it. I got involved, and never really, never really looked back from that. And then a bit about your accountancy career. Talk to me about that because I think you've you're now a director of a company, but you you had to have started out somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's um it's a really good question because something that I was aware of when I was younger was just how few people from the scheme I grew up in went to university or went on to working like a professional career, professional job. And I actually wanted to be a pilot. That was my childhood dream. Um, it was a, a Christmas present when I was like 14. It was a trial flight lesson. And after that, I was just, the, the, the bug had bitten. And I've still got this thing for planes and aviation now. But I know it's, it's probably not going to be a career option at this stage. But accountancy was just a means to an end. You know, I just, I looked at my subjects. I, I got two hires. You know, one of them was accountancy, and I thought, right, what can I do with that? And the intention was to do that for a few years, uh, get the money for flying lessons, hopefully you know, get an airline to take me on. Um, apologies, advanced if there's any pilots listening, but I look at the market just now and what's happening with the pandemic, and I think maybe actually that was you a bullet dodged. dodged the big know? time, yeah. <laughs> uh, exactly. Um, so accountancy was just really a means to an end, and... It was it was a good career to go into, you know. If if you come from a background where you don't have a lot of money or family support to to rely on, because it's one of the few professions you can enter without a uni degree. So you can literally leave school at sixteen, get a traineeship with a firm, start off learning on the job from the very beginning, making the T sector as well. You know, then doing like the distance learning thing with um the, the college day release. And then you can go boom, straight into doing the, the ACCA exams. I think credit to the ACCA for having a system like that, which doesn't require a degree for entry because 
it, it makes the profession far more socially mobile than say the legal profession so that was that was basically it um it was partly out of necessity it was um it was a big culture shock to be honest jamie i mean jason it was um you know i was the first person in my family to ever have a professional job that you put on a, a shirt and a tie to go to um i was 16 so it's quite an easy age to to learn and to let yourself be molded by the people around about you and you know i've made some comments it's um skeptical about the working from home measures and i understand during the pandemic there was a cause for that but i think unless there's a good clinical scientific reason for it i think it's good to have especially people starting off in their career working in an office because the amount of stuff I learned just by absorbing the people around about me and how they behaved, how they spoke to clients, how they behaved in a professional environment, that that was really important to somebody from my background that, that didn't have anyone else in the family to, to fill on for that support, for that guidance. So you know, the first couple of years were, were, were difficult because of the culture shock, but it's like anything else, the longer you do it, the more you get used to it. I would chime in on that, what you said about the office. I, I, I'm a teacher, I'm a primary school teacher, and I think, although it's, we're not an office, but I find that the classroom is the greatest leveller because, say, you've got, you've got, we'll have kids that are from well off backgrounds and kids that are, that have basically nothing, but they come into the classroom and they're an equal. They have a learning experience that, that they wouldn't get at home. And I think if you've got the office as well, and the pandemic, say there was someone like you growing up in Barrowfield, working from home, like home to you isn't going to be the prime working condition than what it would be for someone who, say, grew up in Newton Mearns, somewhere like that, and then gets to work in their nice home. Whereas the office, yes. the office means that they have the, they're both employed by the same company and they have the same experience. Or if somebody wants to push themselves to do more in the office, it's recognised and there's the chance for them to progress, whereas you're limited by the four walls around you. And what goes on inside person A's four walls is, could be completely different to what goes on inside person B's four walls. I completely completely agree, Jason. It's it's like there's actually been some debate around that in terms of like people in business meetings on, on Zoom or Teams, and people have been judged for like what's behind them. Is it a big bookcase full of books? Or is it, you know, a big plasma TV or is it just a bare wall? You know, what are people's living conditions? And, and, and we're showing people, and, and same for your pupils as well, usually what goes on at home is not something that is, is shared with all of their classmates, maybe just their friend circle, but not all of their classmates. So it was really opening up a door which would never have been opened up before. And for some kids, especially, like, the classroom is a piece of stability that they might have in their lives you know I think the same would be about the workplace but as well I think that's in a, in a sense that people's mental health as well at least if you've got if you like long or you take comfort in a constant and in, in a routine then getting up and going to your work that's that sense of purpose going into a place that you take that away and it's no, no wonder that people that mental health could be said to be the secondary pandemic that's going on at the same time as the coronavirus one. Uh, and I think that is something that we should be very mindful of. I mean, I, I'm not a lockdown sceptic. You know, COVID went through my family quite quite severely. I had a, an aunt who was in intensive care for 10 weeks. You know, I, I take the virus very seriously. Uh, but I do think that we need to get the balance right between lockdown and COVID prevention measures with everything else that we need society to do, such as schooling young people and making sure they're grown up, well-rounded and capable for the, the world and life ahead of them. I think, thankfully, it's been seen in the news that the plan is, certainly at the UK level, to wind back most, if not all, of the the sort of coronavirus laws, which I think is a good thing. We need to, we need to press on with life. And people have now been triple and quadruple vaccinated. What, what have we been held back for? Well, you're absolutely right. Like it, it was, it was an easier sell to people to say, right, you can't do this, you can't do that. You need to homeschool kids whilst you're running a job. You know that was another major factor for people working from home as well. 
if um, you know, having a family, starting a family was already an impediment in some workplaces, but having a family who are sitting around the same dinner table as you, you're being taught by someone like yourself while you're trying to conduct a meeting. Yeah, you know, that was a professional setback but for a lot of workers as well. So yeah, it is welcome news. It was an easier sell when nobody was jabbed, but with three, four jabs in people's arms, people are kind of getting to the stage of, well, what else are we, what else are we waiting for here? You know? So this, tell me then, MCC accountants, when did you, you serve as a director, am I right in saying that? Yeah, 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 you're, you're absolutely, absolutely right, Jason. Um, basically, um, so the firm I trained with, I spent a long period of time there, but the, the, it was quite difficult to get a boost up, you know, get a promotion because I came in as the wee boy. You know, I came in at the age of 16, uh, but that stage I was 21, 22, and in some ways you're still kind of seen as the, the trainee. So I moved on, went to a small practice in Motherwell, Lanarkshire, and it was absolutely brilliant. You know, it was very laid back by comparison. Um, it was a small team. The, the, the boss there, the, the owner of that business, he was very inspirational, taught me a lot of stuff. And there was a, a period of time in life then when I had a, I was a, a wee bit overweight. I was uh, heavily a smoker, talking a packet a day, 20 a day. And I lost four relatives to cancer within a couple of years, two grandparents, two uncles. And they were all smokers. And I thought, this is what life's about, you know. Um, a, a lot of my life was geared towards just getting to a point of feeling stability and security for the first time in my life. And there comes a point where you, you, you've met that, or you think you've met that. Um, and that's kind of where I was at. You know, I had a, a wee flat over in Mount Florida, which was a world away from what I'd seen growing up. And uh, I thought, well, well what, what next? And a friend of mine had his own accountancy practice and he was telling me a few bits and pieces about how he got started and things. So I thought, when I get my bonus at the end of May, I'm saving that up and this is what I'm going to go off and do. And that was that was it. It was that kind of realisation. Some people go through it earlier in life than others that you realise life is finite. You only get one and you only regret the things that you don't do. So... Um, yeah, I just I took, took that risk of going out and starting up a more and I had the experience and stuff like that. And I think with the involvement in politics as well, you know, when you've chapped in a stranger's door for the 200th time, you kind of feel a bit more confident in speaking to people, a bit more confident in selling yourself. Like accountants have this rep for being really introverted, shy people that would rather hide behind a computer screen than talk to folk. I think my involvement in the political realm kind of boosted my confidence in my like interpersonal communication skills. So I found actually I was really good at taking difficult, complex accountancy things and explaining it in a way that people would understand. And that's really where there was value and uh, in selling your services, promoting your services. So that's I went off and set up and done one thing and I've been doing that for pushing six years now. Started Lois Counter. <laughs> Then we'll go come forward into the, the mid twenty tens, the first re- independence referendum. Were you involved in the Conservative Party by that point, or did you just decide to campaign for no because you were a unionist without being a a sort of signed up conservative? Um, yeah, I, I was uh, an active conservative at that time, so I stood as a paper candidate in the the Lund ward in twenty twelve, uh, which was a completely different era for. The Scottish Conservative Party. It was pre Ruth, really. Um, you know the the big Ruth bounce back, which occurred during in the RF. So you know we were on to a hiding to nothing. Ruth had just became leader pretty much. Um, so I, I was involved in the party loosely then, and then the NDRF came along and that turned everything on its head because, you know, the, the, these people that I thought mm, not very much politically of, I've always aimed to get on well with people on a personal basis, regardless of the politics. You know, I'll take people as I find them. If they want to treat me with a standard of respect and decorum, I, I, I'll happily do that, whether it's, you know, a communist or a nationalist or Labour, whatever. 
But um, during the NDRF, of course, I've got to know these Labour people and some Lib Dems as well. And of course, a whole ton of people that were not party politically aligned during the Better Together campaign. And I was being asked because I had that wee bit of experience of being a candidate before, of going out to speak at Huston's to the bat for her, her no. And uh, I found myself in panels with people like Brent Machiavitti, who I was kind of aware of anyway, because Monkel was an, a Labour activist in East End at that time. Um, plus like Margaret Curran and Patricia Gibson and others. Um, so yeah, it was it was a really interesting time getting to know all these people. And that was around the same time that, that my political views started to, to soften and come a bit more back to centre, you know, because I realised that actually there's there's quite a wide range of people in the Labour Party too. You know, you've got your your hard left people, and at that stage we're very much a fringe, and it, it was unbelievable to think that within a few years they would be taking over and running the Labour Party with, with Jeremy Corbyn and Momentum. But at that stage it was still a, very much a, a kind of centrist to centre-left Blairite New Labour operation. And a lot of those people, that, that their views weren't wildly opposed to mine. You know what I mean? There was, there was some common ground there, especially around the the vision for, for building a stronger Scotland and a, a strong United Kingdom. So, yeah, I felt really infused with that campaign and um, it was, I was certainly glad to be part of it. But I would say, it, whilst it was all worth doing, it was all worth doing once. And I'm very much of the view that we should re respect the outcome of referenda if you're a true Democrat. And we should um, we should leave that for the the generation that was promised. Then what if the the, the common retort to that, and I'm obliged to say it to you, is that if SNP campaign on a ticket, say a, a, at a Scottish Parliament election, saying that if you vote for us, we'll give you another referendum, and say that was to come to pass, why is that not a a legitimate reason or a mandate, as they say, for a, another referendum? Well, I mean, it's, it's impossible to you know, respect that mandate and respect the first mandate. You know, you, you cannot say you advocate more democracy by having more referenda without also undermining your case that you were respecting democracy in the first place. The second I would say to that, second thing I say to that is that the SNP didn't win an outright majority. You know, they, they, they're basically in government thanks to support from the Green Party. And to a certain extent, it's it's um, it's using the Scottish political system in a way it wasn't designed for. The, the Scottish political system, with the additional member system, it was designed for a, you know, a, a multitude of parties like the Rainbow Parliament. You know, we had about seven or eight different political parties represented. In some ways, because of this single constitutional debate, we're becoming very narrow. We're, we're moving away. From the Rainbow Parliament, where you had Solidarity, the SSP, the Senior Scottish Citizens and Unity Party, etc., etc., and it, it's fallen within a pro-nationalist block and a, a unionist block. And I would argue that splitting the SNP vote between SNP and constituency, SNP and Greens on on the list, is in some ways gaming the system. And I directly quote Nicola Sturgeon in that phrase, game in the system, because it's what she used against Alex Salmon's Aliba party when they were pushing for the so-called supermajority of voting SNP in the constituency and Aliba in the list. The constitutional issue, the, the quagmire that we exist in, the yes versus no, I have no, I, I have no idea how that unravels itself. How, what, what do we need to do to get past that? I, I can't wait to get past it, to be honest with you, because I, I became politically engaged pre Yeah, you know, I became politically engaged because I wanted to see Scotland becoming more of a merit meritocratic system. I wanted to see more people from my background getting a fair crack of the whip. I wanted to see more people being able to get on the house and ladder. I want to see Scotland get back to its kind of roots of being this innovative, entrepreneurial country. And I feel like all of that debate is on hold until one side or the other gives up. The, the analogy I use for the situation Scotland is in now, it's like political trench warfare. We've been stuck in these trenches for the last, what, eight years. Nobody has gained any ground, nobody has lost any ground, despite 
all of the external factors that have taken place, like the Conservatives winning an outright majority, the UK leaving the EU, uh, Boris becoming Prime Minister and the ratings say that Boris isn't that popular in Scotland. And then, of course, um, the pandemic response and how we've seen Scotland diverge from how other parts of the UK responded. And in spite of all these factors, the polls are still consistently showing that no are winning. And if I was pro-independence, I would be incredibly downbeat and frustrated at the moment because I'd be wondering what exactly is it going to take to get to that 60% regular for yes in the opinion polls. Because I would say if it's not happening under the circumstances we've seen the last five, six, seven years, it's probably not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, obviously, if you strongly believe in something, you, know, you, you don't easily move from that position. Right? You don't need to tell a Conservative from East End of Glasgow that I joined the party when we had 15 MSPs and like 14, 13% of the vote. Just because we weren't winning, it didn't mean you don't stick by what you believe in. But sometimes you need to just give it a buy and get on with the other 99% of stuff that politics should be about. Because until we get to that stage, a reasonable agreement of both sides of the debate, you're going to have, as long as the threat is there of an Indy Ref 2, you're going to have the other parties on the other side saying, well, we're against that. The SNP are riding high in the polls still. And for as long as unionist support is split across three different political parties, then no individual party is going to topple the SNP. So um, what's your solutions to that? I know some people have advocated, you know, having some sort of grand coalition around the unionist parties. That's perhaps a debate for another time. But um, for as long as we're stuck in these trenches, nobody's going to gain or lose any ground. And I think it's basically a war of attrition. Who gives up first? Do, do the unionists give up and just let the SNP have their way because they can get 48% of the Scottish public, but 48% is not an outright majority? It might be enough to get into power on Holyrood, but it's not an outright majority. So there's a little anomaly in the system there and that between the SNP and the Greens, they have a majority of MSPs in Parliament, but until they resolve the fact they don't have a majority of Scottish opinion, we're stuck in this catch-22 situation. Let's say that I think the plan is that they want to have a referendum sometime next year, which I think is really it's really soon. But just go just go with those words. I, I that was a plan last year and the year before. I know, I know, I know. It's it's. I, I've said as well before that I think it suits SMP, it suits Nicholas Urgent to dangle the carrot. Like the carrot is more appealing than the reality of it because it, let's say. Say that they get the referendum and they lose, which I think they would lose, then that's it. Where where do you go from there? Like you've they're not they're basically lame ducks sitting in a parliament. They've had the referenda twice in ten years, hasn't gone their way. Even surely they can't come back from that. So it's the longer it's held off, it's it's as though Nicola Sturgeon and all the SNP the people, they've got their cushy jobs in Edinburgh, the champagne socialists that live up in London as well. It's it's a good gig to be seen to want it without actually having to go through with it. I, I would I would completely agree with that analogy and um, that analysis. And uh, Alex Salmond was known for being a bit of a gambler, right? He was a more he was more of a risk taker than than Nicola Sturgeon, and I think yeah. Ni Nicola Sturgeon was well, it was a, certainly a senior SNP spokesperson, maybe not Nicola herself, is on record as saying we would want to see, yes, 60% plus in opinion polls for a month before we have another referendum. Because you, you, you're right, I mean, to, to lose once after what, two and a half, three years of a campaign almost with all the resources of the Scottish Civil Service behind you, David Cameron was very hands-off in terms of setting the rules of Inderef, basically let them you know, set the rules of the game and, and, and they still lost it. So you would want to be absolutely sure, and I think Nicola Sturgeon wants to be absolutely sure that she would win it before actually calling it. But nevertheless, she's got to give her grassroots, she's got to give her base support, some, dare I say, red meat for a topical turn of phrase, um, Operation Red Meat. But 
you should be running Operation Red Meat. For, yeah, they need, for they need something to be run, they need something to be aiming towards. Like, uh, yeah, they can't. She can't keep putting it off forever. But is that like? But this is what I would advocate if, if I was to take my conservative hat off for a minute and put on an SNP hat. I would say let's give this a buy for let's say even one term of the Scottish Parliament, and let's focus on everything else that we are currently responsible for, such as Scotland schools, such as the the, the mountain waiting lists for. NHS procedures, such as run down local services. Let's focus on these things instead. Let's focus on the record number of drug deaths that we've got in Scotland. Let's show we can do all of these things well. Let's show how competent we are. And maybe then people will trust us to run a country fully. That's what they should be doing. That They should be playing the long game. And I actually think that they're not doing that because They've run out of steam, they've run out of ideas, and they haven't a clue what to do next. The Scottish Parliament has its record level of funding. A record level of funding. You know, they should be setting about all these grand plans, but it seems to be on all the domestic issues, business as usual. And I don't think that's going to inspire anyone that isn't already convinced by independence to vote for it. And the other thing I would make on that, another observation, in 2014, it was older people who were cited as being the reason why no one. Well, we're, we're eight years on. I think of the relatives I have lost within my circle over that period of time. Yeah. A lot of the older people who would have voted in 2014 are no longer with us. Yet, the opinion polls have not shifted in favour of yes. If anything, Scotland has an ageing demographic. That's been mentioned many times about you know, why we need more immigration coming to Scotland and why that's a good thing. We have an ageing demographic. And if people are less likely to vote for independence as, as they get older, because they've got pensions, or they've got children, they've got grandchildren, they own property, they own a business, whatever it is, Scotland has an ageing demographic. That makes independence even further away than it was in 2014. As, yeah, they don't like to say these things, though. That's... No, they, they don't, <laughs> and to be honest with you, I, I'm really enjoying having this having this chat with you because it feels like so much of Scottish politics and analysis of politics is just shouting and bawling at each other. No, see, I don't, I, I don't advocate that. I, I like this. Like, I do this because I, if anybody can speak to me and put the point across in a in an affable, respectful, and straight up way, then I'm happy to. to I'm happy. I'll have anybody on here because it's. I think the debate needs to, it needs to change because I, I don't like the, the trench warfare is a great analogy, but if you get people talking either to me or to each other in a fair way, I think you need to have people engaged, people to make a choice, well informed of all the facts without people, the people that want you to vote them shouting at each other. Like that's, I, I I am highly critical of everybody, but I am also respectful of everybody. Does that make sense? I think that's that's what I would like this to be. I think that's the that's the way the debate should be. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, you, you, you don't need to agree with everything someone says, but you can still do it in, in a respectful way. And I think that the, the crop of politicians before what we have at present, um, they were more able to do that, I think, than what we see at present. Absolutely. Right, then present day, so we've got, we're in late February 2022, we've got the local elections coming up. You are going to run in the East Renfrewshire ward of Newton, Mearns North and Neilston. Is that right? Yeah. Have I worded that? It's all wordy. All these council yeah. wards, there's yeah, lots of parts yeah, them. <laughs> yeah, well, it could be worse. It could be Mulgay and Eastern Barton. Yeah. Right uh, <laughs> it's, it's always a curveball. Uh, yeah, I, I'm doing Newton, Mearns North and Neilston. Which is um, it's it's a fantastic ward. Um, I was volunteering for a couple of charities here. One called Pulling Together. We were doing food deliveries during the pandemic, and also um, what they call the Retail Trust, which is like the Hugh Fraser Estate for a retirement home for people that have worked in retail and uh, doing like food shopping and stuff again. Um, re really enjoyed it, and what what I would say. And this is perhaps a different take on, on people that think conservatives think there's no such thing as society. I, I very much of the David Cameron mold that, yeah, there is such a thing as society. It's just a different thing from, from the state. And He was know, the big society, wasn't he? That was his thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in, growing up, I was taught that 
your your brother and sister's keeper. And a socialist might say, well, I'm a brother and sister's keeper. But actually, they think it's the state. It's the state's job to do that. Whereas a conservative, I think it's society's job to do it. I um, appreciate that's not a universally held view, but I'm more of a, a pragmatic person rather than driven by party ideology. And what we've seen during the pandemic was just how fragile society actually is and how valuable it really is because it's, it's when you kind of feel like you're losing something, you see its true value. And I still remember April, May 2020, when you could go into a supermarket and there was no meat available for sale. There was hardly any food stuff available for sale, certainly no toilet roll available for sale. And yeah, I'll admit that was a scary time. That was a scary time. I remember reading stories in the paper about whether um, the army was going to be brought in to ensure there was um, a supply chain to restock supermarkets. And when you're at a stage where some people may not be able to buy the food that they need, that's where you start to see the breakdown of society. And I felt that we were, it seemed like we were getting close to that stage anyway. So I think we've seen, all of us have seen firsthand just what it takes to make a society work. And you know, if you've got a good community, you, should, um, you shouldn't take it for granted. You've got to stand up, be counted. And, um, you know, a good society requires careful stewardship to, to look after it. And I, I don't want to be overly party political, but if you look at what's going on in Glasgow, for example, you know, you can see how quickly a good area can, can enter decline. You know, public libraries being closed, refuse collection falling behind, vermin control getting out of control. Um, you can't take these things for granted. And that's some of the values that I'll be standing on in these elections. What is, if say for someone, or most, say most people that listen to this wouldn't know or aren't familiar with Newton Mearns, North and Neilston, how would you describe that council word? It's, um, a lot of it is, is fairly new build, you know, so like Giffnock, you know, Osby, etc. you know, these were more seen as being like overspill areas of Glasgow, part of the greater Glasgow area. Whereas the, the Merns is more like a, Newton Merns is more like a small town in its own right, almost, that's kind of in the process of being swallowed up by Glasgow. Yeah. So there's a lot of housing here built. I mean, there was an old um, village of Newton Merns, and you can see photos of it online with people on horses and carts and stuff, but it was very, very small scale to what it is now. A lot of the housing was built in like the 1980s, obviously with people you're getting on the housing ladder or perhaps taking a second step on the housing ladder um, and, and moving moving out from, from Glasgow. Um, that's That trend has continued. I feel like every and time I drive down the M77, it gets closer and closer to the motorway. Like It's just yeah. a, it's just sprawling all the time. It, it, it has, and considering you know, Scotland has a, a stagnant population, I, I think it says a lot that obviously people are... Um, you know, more more mobile and they're, they're moving out to where they, they see there's a higher standard of, of living or better schooling etc um a bit more countryside a bit more green space so it, it's obviously it, it's really good to see that that people are able to to make that step and as a conservative i think you know great that's that's the best investment that you could that you could make um but we also need to balance that with you know environmental demands and that we don't actually build in all the green space and the reason why people want to move out here in the first place. So a lot of this is, is new build. I mean, I live just off the Stuartton Road and I remember going for my shopping at the Avenue about 10 years ago and it was it was almost like farmland the whole way up, right up. And now it's built all the way on the left-hand side and after the railway bridge, all the way on the right-hand side as well. So... It is a, an area very much under under change and a lot of a lot of development, and um, we've got a one just now, uh, like Maiden Hill and Mallettsview. So basically, up from Glasgow all the way right down to the the motorway junction, it will be fully developed. So yeah, you're right on that one. Okay, so here in Glasgow, we've got the the Glasgow Tories have got the five point plan, but I would say that they're. Their campaign is against the backdrop of a a very, very, very poor 
SNP, and that's me being kind when I say that. Very, very poor. So what what are the challenges that you face? Like, what are you campaigning against in East Renfrewshire? Like, what is the lie of the land there? I know you've got an SNP Labour based coalition. So what, like, is for the people that aren't familiar with East Renfrewshire, what is the state of affairs and why would voting Conservative be of benefit to anyone that lives there? Yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, East Renfrewshire is a tiny wee council. Glasgow is almost like a mini parliament in its own right. And a lot of the politics that goes on in Glasgow City Council, it's like a replica of, of Holyrood. And in some ways, the standard of debate is a little higher too. So there's a lot of party political stuff which goes on over there, which doesn't quite to the same extent in East Renfrewshire. It's, there's only 18 councillors up for grabs. Um, it's uh, The Conservatives have not been in administration since the reorganisation you know, from the old district councils into, um, what was it, 1996 or something like that. So it's been a long time since the Conservatives have been in administration here. It's been Labour and SNP joint administrations with a, a couple of independents that are, are, are not firmly part of the administration. So if you are fed up with the green belt being eroded, if you are disappointed with the condition of the roads, if you don't think you're getting value for money because your council tax has increased disproportionately here because of the abandon of the properties, then there's only really one alternative administration who could throw Labour and the SNP out, and that's your local Conservative team of candidates. In terms of the issues that we're standing on here, um, so specifically within my ward, there's been a whole lot of new housing built over the years. There's a lot of families here, a lot of young professionals here who are now working from home. The mobile phone reception is not particularly great, and for some people, the broadband is not particularly great either. So, yeah, I mean, they might sound very unsexy, small-scale issues, but you know, all politics is local. If that's something that you've got to contend with day in, day out, you know, you've got two kids doing remote learning on their iPads and you're trying to get into a Teams meeting. The, the issues, I would say, in my world are, are more ward-specific. You know, it's not like we're trying to replicate in national politics. It's not as party political in the way Glasgow is. It's obviously a, it's, it's a very big authority. It has a huge budget. The, the main issues we'll be contending with, apart from you know, like the specific ward issues, is going to be the huge and deep cut to a funding settlement from the Scottish Government and how exactly we, we're going to bridge that gap because services have already been cut back efficiencies have already been sought and we've got very limited powers to try and stimulate some economic development within the authority we're not like glasgow where we have a major economic powerhouse or a central business district it's mostly rural or suburban areas we're not going to attract huge big businesses in here that are going to be paying loads of rates to the the authority so it is going to be a very very difficult settlement and uh, we're obviously very disappointed with the SNP's offer because with the amount of expansion going on in East Renfrewshire, the, the council has to provide so much more. There's more traffic on the roads. The roads need maintained more often. The schools are at breaking point. Everybody's moving for the schools, but the schools are struggling to cope. We've got an aging population here as well. There's more demand in social services, home care services. So the council has been asked to do more and more and more but in real terms with less money. And that's a wrap. A massive thank you to this week's guest for coming on to the show. I hope you all enjoyed listening as much as I enjoyed chatting. All of the relevant social media accounts can be found in the show notes. The usual bits and pieces from me to see you out... The best way to keep up to date with the latest goings on relating to Lost for Words is to follow using the handle at Lost for Words Pod on both Twitter and Instagram. Send a message on either Twitter or Instagram if you have anything you'd like to ask a guest or for a guest suggestion or even just to leave any feedback. 
The best way to support the show is to hit the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And if you use an Apple device, a five star review in the podcast app would be amazing. If you like what you hear, tell someone. Word of mouth also helps us to grow. Finally, to round off, all of your support and continued listening is genuinely appreciated. It means a lot to me to have you on this journey too. I am your host Jason and I hope to have you back next week for another episode of the Lost for Words podcast.